Assalamualaikum. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Adlinda. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Fang, for the very impressive data on immunotherapy. I think I've learned a lot from that as well. Um, so let's move on. Uh, this morning, we have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Chu Yao Man. Uh, he's our uh, consultant neonatologist at Pediatric Department UMMC. His group has been doing a lot of um, Cochrane systematic review on the uh, neonatology problems, especially in the premature babies. So for today, he's going to present to us the Cochrane systematic review from evidence to clinical practice, our neonatal experience and publications. So without further ado, I would like to uh, call upon Prof Chu to present. Okay, uh, thank you very much Prof Yazid for the kind introduction. Um, so from, from our side, I think we have been involved in this Cochrane uh, systematic reviews for a couple of years and I want to share some of our experience, uh, whether some of these studies can be translated into clinical practice and what are the challenges that we have and what are the, our, our own publications we have impacted uh, the neonatal practice around the world. Okay, so as you know, the, our systematic review is actually uh, you know, when we publish, it's actually high quality and it's based on the timely research evidence um, and it's considered gold standard in providing evidence-based decision. And at the moment, there are more than 7,500 reviews that have been published and this has guided a lot of clinical uh, decision-making around the world. Um, so on our side, usually when there's a publication, we will try to put it from evidence-based and uh, places around the world, they will try to put it into clinical practice uh, where possible. And it has formed a lot of uh, statements in clinical practice guidelines. And of course, lately, because it is evidence-based, it's also used in medical legal, whether it's fortunate or unfortunately, because we do have a, a rising cases of medical legal uh, cases, as you know. So how do we translate this into clinical practice? So on our side, when we look at uh, uh, reviews or, you know, when we start, when we start doing all these reviews, uh, there's a great recommendation, which I think most of you will be familiar, whereby it's uh, providing us a, in terms of a summary of evidence and a systematic approach, right? And there's five main criteria where there's risk of bias, imprecision, inconsistency, uh, indirectness, and also publication bias. So they are quite strict in terms of uh, uh, selecting uh, clinical studies. And when we report, we report it in a way that whether it's high quality, High quality means the true effect is almost similar to the estimated effect. Moderate is as close. Low usually is, a, is, is markedly different from the estimated effect. Very low, it probably does not uh, uh, translate into uh, uh, very high quality evidence. Okay, so at the moment, we have five titles that's registered in Cochrane Reviews. Um, I'll go through some of them, uh, but not all of them. So normally when we do it, usually we have to submit a title registration first. The titles are usually based on what is current or what is uh, what is happening and what is, what does the neonatal community wants to know or what is uh, the, the, the current topics, right? Um, so some of them uh, from title registration, they will move on to protocol. Protocol is where we put in what we want to do, okay? What are the aspects that we are looking at? And then only after that, after two or three years, then we will publish the full review. Okay, so this is one of our first few uh, publications uh, where we look at antimicrobial dressings for prevention of catheter-related infections in newborn. Um, so at this time, this is to determine the effect of antimicrobial uh, impregnated uh, central venous catheters in preventing this catheter-related bloodstream infection in newborns. So this is actually a very important review because there are many types of antimicrobial uh, uh, agents that, that are used. So at the moment, at that time, uh, the conclusions that we made was based on moderate quality evidence. Moderate quality means there is some evidence that they, they do, uh, that, that, it, that there is some evidence in it. Uh, so this was comparing uh, uh, using chlorhexidine dressing and alcohol skin cleansing. They do reduce catheter colonization, but made no difference in terms of uh, catheter-related bloodstream infection as well as sepsis. Okay, and this was comparing, comparing to the polyurethrin dressing and povidone iodine. And the other conclusion, because they, they use many, many types of dressing, so they, they did find that the chlorhexidine dressing and alcohol dressing actually pose a substantial risk of contact dermatitis in preterm infants. So this alcohol with preterm infants, they actually burn the skin. 
So, uh, so that was the conclusion that they made. There's other types of patch like silver alginate, um, because there were a lot of concerns with regards to usage of silver. While it appeared to be safe, it is still insufficient. So uh, that's the reason why silver alginate patch has been, uh, um, it's not so favorable nowadays. Okay, now this is not our review. This was published many, many years ago, but it changed a lot of our neonatal practice. This was looking at prophylactic synthetic surfactant. Okay, so prophylactic means we started from birth uh, for every preterm babies. And at that time, I mean, surfactant we know is deficient in the lungs of many premature babies. And this leads to a disease that we call respiratory distress syndrome. And currently we do use this uh, 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 like we, we do use surfactant at the moment to give to prevent as well as treat this problem. So the objective of this systematic review at the time was to assess the effect of prophylactic administration of synthetic surfactant. And if you look at the x-rays, I mean, we all know that, you know, when, when pre the premature babies are born, um, their lungs are actually very solid. Okay, but after we give surfactant, they are very aerated and we do have, uh, we do see marked improvement. At that time, if you look at this review, the confidence interval the, in terms of the risk ratio was 0.7 and it's between 0.58 to 0.85. That's the 95% confidence interval. And this actually is in favor of prophylactic surfactant. Okay, so at that time, the conclusion was when you give prophylactic intrathecal administration, uh, they do improve clinical outcomes. So they have decreased risk of pneumothorax, decreased risk of pulmonary interstitial emphysema, as well as a decreased risk of mortality. So at that time, it was very, you know, when this paper came out, everybody was rushing and everybody was giving prophylactic uh, surfactant, okay? So in Malaysia at that time, uh, that was the time when I started uh, uh, clinical practice at the time, it was given to all preterm babies, especially less than 32 weeks. But after that, it was found that it cost a lot to even administer. And if you look at it, there's about three and a half thousand babies. And if you calculate the cost, it's at least six million. So at that time, it was uh, a challenge in terms of cost. Right. Um, so in UMMC, um, our site uh, prior to 2013, if, uh, patients have to pay actually. Okay. So if you don't pay, you don't get it. Unfortunately, that was how it was. But we felt, you know, we had to uh, appeal to the management. And now currently it's given free to all babies, irregardless of uh, your, your status. Okay. Um, so from prophylactic, now we use uh, selective use. Okay. So there was this term because you cannot be giving to everyone. So some centers have started to, to use selective use and also with the advent of CPAP machines, uh, this was when a lot of people uh, changed their practice. So this was com to compare the effect of the prophylactic surfactant um, in, in our very preterm babies. And again, they put a statement from the first study where it shows that although early trials did show a decreased uh, risk of mortality, but the current practice, had, you know, as, as the years goes by, um, they do not support these differences and less risk of chronic lung disease and death if you use CPAP, okay, and selective surfactant administration. So what happens is we went from prophylactic to selective, uh, which means to say who actually needs it. <clears throat> so this is in our Malaysian Pediatric Protocol. So they do have conditions to give. So if you're below 28 weeks, definitely we need to give. If you are between 28 to 32 weeks, uh, if your oxygen requirements is more than 30%, we give. Uh, and normally the way we give is there's this thing that we call insure technique where we intubate, we give the surfactant and then we extubate to CPAP. So that changes a lot of our practices in terms of intubation. We do not intubate a lot of babies nowadays. We try not to because of complications of uh, intubation. Okay. Now, uh, new data John this. So this is uh, one of our areas of, one of my areas of uh, interest. Um, as you know, for John this we use phototherapy. That's the mainstay, okay? Um, and years ago, or rather in early stages, when any baby comes with quite severe John this, most clinicians will use fluid. So they'll put the baby on IV drip, okay? Uh, because it was postulated there's a dilutional effect. It brings down the bilirubin faster, you know, and if you give oral fluids, it en enhance the peristalsis, okay? So there were a lot of theories in, with regards to this. Um, and even if you look at the guidelines around the world, this is in Canada. It's also written, this was in 2007 guidelines. Uh, it's written, even you're non dehydrated, okay? Even if you're not dehydrated, but you come in with severe jaundice, um, and, you know, and if you give extra fluids, it's postulated or it is proven, or rather, uh, you know, if you look at the evidence, is uh, evidence level 1B, it reduces the risk of 
exchange transfusion. So there was actually a proponent that if you come in with severe jaundice, they do give fluids. Now, so that means the, clini clin uh, the clinical practice at that time was if you come in with severe jaundice, you receive IV fluids. So every baby practically was on IV fluids. Now, so we, we came up with this review uh, that was in 2017. Okay, so this was a big review, uh, mainly because uh, everybody was giving fluids and uh, actually the WHO asked the Cochrane group to expedite this uh, review because it was very important. And at that time, it was to assess the risk and benefit of fluid supplementation, uh, you know, for babies who require jaundice. So if you look at this, right, so at four hours, if you give fluids, there is a mean difference, okay? So it makes a difference, okay? If you do at 12 hours, if you look at, uh, sorry, four hours after giving fluids, but if you look at 12 hours, 18 hours, it makes no difference, all right? So, and what is more important nowadays when we look at this, it's not, uh, it's not the bilirubin that comes down, but how many patients actually develop abnormal neurological signs? And if you look at it, none of the studies actually reported any kind of side effects of abnormal neurological signs. Um, so we concluded that at that time was the serine bilirubin, yes, it was lower at four to eight hours, but after that, it makes no difference, okay? So the bilirubin levels uh, at 12 hours, 18 hours made no difference at all. And so we concluded at that time, there's no evidence that IV fluid supplementation affected major out clinical outcomes, uh, you know, like cerebral palsy, uh, connectors, right? Um, and, uh, and at that time, it may reduce it at a certain time point, but it's unclear whether it translates into important clinical benefits. So, um, so I was in this committee for development group to publish this management of neonatal jaundice. So this is the uh, CPG that we use nowadays all around Malaysia. And at the time we sat as a committee, we did put this in as there's no good evidence to advocate extra fluids in the management of neonatal jaundice. So at the moment, if you come in with jaundice, you do not need fluids, okay? And at, so if you look at it, how we evolve over time, people have looked at short versus long-term outcomes. Are you looking at reduction in bilirubin? You know, it looks good, okay? But long-term, what does it do? All right, what are the neurodevelopmental outcomes are we looking at? So that is more important. You can do something, but if at the end, it does nothing, you know, the babies are still well, it may not be a, a good intervention, right? But if it does, then yes, then it, it may be put in. Um, uh, for the record, this review actually won the Kenneth Warren Prize uh, and it was voted as the best Cochrane Systematic Review in 2018 uh, for that year, okay? Um, and at that time, uh, Professor Lai is, uh, is actually my mentor, so he, he guided us in terms of a lot of our Cochrane publications um, and he was actually awarded this prize for the year 2018 and this is him uh, at, the, at the Edinburgh Cochrane Collective. All right, so the next thing that we want to look at is prophylactic phototherapy. So if you realize I've been putting up a lot of prophylactic kind of studies, um, people have evolved uh, in the neonatal world, there's a lot of things that was prophylactic, okay, from idomethacine to phototherapy to a lot of uh, uh, interventions that we want to do to prevent certain complications. So this is to look at prophylactic phototherapy to prevent jaundice in preterm infants. And if you look at it, again, is to evaluate the efficacy and safety of prophylactic phototherapy. Now, if you do studies like this, what, do, what would you think the outcome would be? Obviously, if you prophylax everybody, right, there will be an, an effect because jaundice is a major problem. So at that time, it does result in lower peak bilirubin levels, okay? So, and there were fewer neonates who actually had high jaundice, okay? This was what it was proven. So, of course, when we have results like that, um, in terms of um, rate of cerebral palsy, there's no statistically difference, um, okay? But... Um, there's one study that found a slightly lower rate of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment, but if you look at the confidence interval, it's actually borderline 0.74 to 0.99, right? So at that time, it does help to, so the conclusion was it does help to maintain a lower bilirubin levels and may have the effect on rate of exchange transfusion as well as the risk of neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, of course, you know, uh, as all Cochrane, we will always put further well-designed studies will be needed, okay? So at our side, you think it's practical to give uh, phototherapy to all babies. So at that time, I mean, of course, in Malaysia, our incidence of neonatal jaundice is very high compared to the Western countries. Uh, the Asian countries do get it worse, okay? And out of this 75%, 30% can have severe jaundice. And if you look, look at Malaysia, there's more than half a million uh, babies per, per year that's delivered. Um, and if you factor in the cost of phototherapy, and we are not sure how long this prophylactic 
phototherapy. Some studies use it for three days, some use it for five days. So if you use it for everybody, your whole postnatal ward will be blue in color. Um, but of course, it costs a lot of money as well, right? So for our side, even though we acknowledge in our CPG that they do work, they do reduce exchange transition by 78%, and they do reduce the rate of neurodevelopmental outcome uh, because of the lower peak, but we felt it is not so practical to be advocating this for everybody. In the sense that if you can do it, fine, but if you can't, it's not a necessity. Okay, so in our recommendation, we will still put it to put it to, as in the phototherapy, we should commence it only if you need it. Okay, so from again, same like the surfactant, from prophylaxis, we have went, we have gone on to who actually needs it, right? So in our CPG, we do have a table of the levels of phototherapy of when to start and, and uh, at different age group, okay? So this is, uh, so from then we need to look at does this really work and who needs it? Um, and this is actually published about three months ago. So this is to look at high versus low dose conventional phototherapy for neonatal jaundice. And again, we need to look at, from prophylaxis, we are going to look at who actually needs it. Okay, so again, this is to assess this high dose or low dose. So again, people use single photo, double photo, but at the end of the day, we have to define what do you mean by single, what do you mean by double? So for us, we need to define it in a sense of we need to measure, right? Some things we need to measure. So in a sense that, it, uh, so we actually define the high dose means it's more than 30. Okay, so if low dose, it will be less than 30. So there has to be certain definition in terms of the dose of phototherapy. But we at the time, at this time, we want to look at uh, long-term neurological outcomes, right? Like connectors, cerebral palsy, right? This is more important than actually reduction of bilirubin. So again, if you look at our outcome measures, so primary outcomes is mainly neurological from acute bilirubin, encephalopathy, connectors, cerebral palsy, and of course mortality. And if you look at the secondary outcomes, don't, 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 don't worry about this. The reason why I put all this up is when we put up a Cochrane reviews, we have to think of every single outcome or every single thing that is important, right? So again, number one is bilirubin level and all the others. Uh, for every outcomes, we have to actually define the outcomes, um, okay? And this is the latest one that we have actually, we, that, that we will put in as a review. This is to look at lutein and zianzetin to reduce morbidity and mortality in preterm infants. Um, so basically, this review is about uh, using these antioxidants, okay? Now, we know that preterm infants can develop retinopathy or prematurity, eye problems, NEC, uh, you know, bleeding in the brain, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, so they can have every system affected, okay? And of course, we do postulate that oxygen-free radicals, again, it's a hot topic at the time, and even up to now, that they cause damage. So there were, there's a lot of potent antioxidants that's come up, and this is one of them, okay? And it's also postulated that it has anti-inflammatory properties. Um, this is where the notion of carrot is good for your eyes, right? So carotenoids is found in human milk, it, and that includes lutein and zianzatin, beta-carotene and lycopene. So again, many years ago, the, the adult uh, ophthalmology group actually published a uh, uh, usage of lutein and zianzatin. So these are the preferred antioxidants for age-related macular degeneration. And this is to compare with beta carotene because there is a paper that actually quoted the increased incidence of lung cancers with beta carotene, but these are in the group of smokers, okay? And because of that, uh, people have come up with alternatives like lutein and zianzatine. So this is to assess the, effective, the effectiveness of lutein and zianzatine supplementation to reduce this morbidity and mortality. And of course, we want to look at adverse effects as well. Um, and again, the main outcomes that we are looking at is to prevent or to look at the outcomes in terms of retinopathy or prematurity, okay? Because that's the purpose of the, the, the antioxidants in the first place. So, um, so this protocol was published about three years ago. And so now it's time to put in a review and that's, that's what we have been doing, okay? And again, the secondary outcomes, these are mainly neonatal outcomes to see whether it makes or makes any difference or not. So this is in the time of uh, doing this review. Um, so basically, we looked at uh, me and Dr. Yip, another of my co-authors, actually went through 5,000 over articles. Uh, took us almost a month plus. And at the end of the day, we came up with four studies. All right? So you have to go through the records, go through uh, all the databases, and then there's a program that we put in. And at the end, it will sieve out and, and, and come up with four studies. But you have to pick the studies one by one. Okay. So again, when we looked at this, this is not published yet. So uh, we are just going to put into the review group. So basically, it shows that if you are ROP stage 3 and above, okay, 
um, there is some effect. So if you look at the odds ratio is 0.44 uh, with a confidence interval of 0.25 to 0.78. All right. So it does show that for ROP stage three and above, uh, there is some uh, uh, favorable effects. Okay. So in our conclusion, we would have put as there's moderate certainty evidence that this supplementation may reduce occurrence of ROP stage three and above. Um, but on any stage ROP, there's no strong evidence. And there's no evidence that it will help with IVH, NEC, or with all the other new needle outcomes, basically. And again, if you look at the, the, the reports, there was two, two studies that report adverse uh, outcomes, uh, but uh, both studies stated there were no adverse outcomes. Okay, so in summary, we know that Cochrane system, uh, the systematic reviews are gold standard, and it does uh, uh, affect our clinical practice guidelines. Um, the important thing to look is it doesn't mean that if we publish something, you need to apply it strictly, but because you have to look at our local settings. So again, if you look at our local settings, it may apply in, even in our own self. Clang Valley, yes, we may do, but in certain places like Sabah, where the resources are actually very limited, right? So they may have a certain certain kind of clinical practice, and even different regions in Malaysia, they, would, they may or may not. Most of the time, it will, okay? It will just take time to, to trickle through. Uh, financial implications is very important because we cannot be, 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 be spending money on everything. So you have to do a cost-benefit analysis. And lastly, to look at the medical legal implications. Just a word on that. Um, you know, I've been involved in a few medical legal cases uh, over the past few, past few years. We do quote Cochrane studies, but at the same time, uh, what is more important is what does the other people do or, or what is the standard practice, let's put it that way. All right. So with that, I think I will conclude my talk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof Chu, uh, for the review of the systematic concrete review under your unit. It was really uh, enlightening to see that many of our previous work in neonatology is done by, you know, as prophylactic without uh, very good evidence. And I hope with this evidence from Cochrane review, we are more objective in our treatment of our very premature babies. Um, let's look at some of the questions here. I noticed there's a question here from Prof Chan, uh, Prof YK Chan. So this is on jaundice. I think you've touched about jaundice a, a, a bit just now on the fluids as well as the phototherapy. So her question was on, since we have so much sunshine, can we not use this or do a study to get the process of reducing jaundice by this method? And I think we know from our uh, parents or grandparents that one of the things that they tell the, the, the mothers that if you have jaundice baby, just put them under the sun. So what evidence do we have for that? Okay, now for sunshine, now the thing is it doesn't, sunshine does work, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong because the ones that we are using is called a blue wavelength. Now the sunlight has blue wavelength, all right? It's not UV. A lot of people think that the phototherapy machine is UV. It's not. It's blue wavelength at a certain wavelength. That's how they reduce jaundice, okay? Um, at the same time, it also has UV, uh, you know, infrared, which can damage the skin and cause dehydration and sunburn. So in our CPG, we will not recommend this, of course, but we know clinical practice, you know, a lot of parents do ask, can we put this on sunshine? You know, and you tell them, no, 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 I can tell you three days later, they come to you, oh, I, you know, we get other jamola. So I don't know. I don't routinely tell them, but you know you're going to do it. So, you know, I mean, this off the record. La. You tell them safely, seven o'clock for five minutes. <laughs> Rather than, if not, they'll put for don't know how long. La. So again, there, there is a study that was done in, 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 uh, in Africa, right? In Africa, they don't have money to buy the machine. So what they do is there is a filtering. So there is a filter, it's called filtered sunlight. So there, it's actually a very cheap filter. You know, like those car, you know, that they, they do, you You know, if you do your, your, your screening for your car, uh, if you cover it, there are certain, radi certain, certain, certain waves that they, they cut off. So they do have, they do produce a cheap kind of filter in Africa and that's what they use over there. So there is evidence that if you use that, it does reduce. Um, but in Malaysia, of course, we cannot be putting <coughs> for, you know, for, for X amount of hours because it is actually very, very dangerous. And because we have a safer method to do it, uh, we will not propose them to put under the sunshine. Nah. Do you think you will get an ethics approval if you want to do <laughs> <laughs> uh, You know, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any question here, but from, from the journey that your, your group has taken, 
um, looking at all the Cochrane systematic review. Can, is there any last word for anyone else here who wants to really do the Cochrane okay. systematic um, review? I mean, it's not easy to do. Um, it is not easy to do, to be honest, because number one, you have to get the title registered. And normally, they will want somebody who has done the Cochrane with track record to actually put in and going together. If you go in alone, you will probably not get approved because, you know, you have to prove. Because otherwise, you go in and you don't publish, you know. And there's always a pressure to publish because uh, when you put in a title, within a year or so, you have to come up with a protocol. And within two years, you have to come up with, with a review. And every two years, you actually have to update. So, uh, there must be a, a, a kind of a track record. But if, you know, but if you, any one of you interested, you can ask me and then I can get, get with Prof. Like Prof. Like is my, our mentor and he has guided us, you know, in terms of all this. Lah. So I still ask him, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in Cochrane Review, but, uh, but he has helped me a lot. Lah. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Chu. I would just uh, give this opportunity to anyone out there who wants to ask any questions before we close this session. No, okay. Since it's already nine o'clock, uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation, Prof Chu, and also Prof uh, Fang for the very interesting two different topics this morning, but really give us a lot of idea, give us a lot of uh, new information on how we, how we best manage our patients. Thank you very much.